and then I'll make fun of our backgrounds and how I have like yeah. coloring crayons and Michael has <laughs> resistance bands and Cody has like her wall of fame. Right, right. So. podcast about moderation in all things. I am Erin Green. And I am Michael Gray. And we have a third today. We have a, a third party with us. Yes. <laughs> we yeah. want to introduce our friend Cody and we're going to have a little conversation with her. Um, welcome Cody Stone. Hello. It's good to be here. I'm excited. Good to have you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, so the first thing, let's just hear how everybody's Thanksgiving was because we just came off of Thanksgiving holiday and I for one had a great one. I'm hoping y'all did. <laughs> you say that so like arrogantly like I had a great holiday. No, <laughs> it was a staycation. Like I'm we were kidding. at home almost the whole time. <laughs> I know you did, Michael. You went camping. Uh yeah, we had to cut our camping. We went camping on Tuesday and had to cut it short one night because Wednesday night it was going to be like thunderstorms all night long. We were tent camping. And Sophie, who is my five-year-old, is very much afraid of thunder. So oh, we're no. like, okay, so no sleep all night long, wet tents, wet everything. Let's just go home. So we stayed till like Wednesday night, like at six and came home. And it was fun though. We had a really good time. Girls were bummed to leave early, which was a good sign that they had fun. And then we had Thanksgiving on Friday with uh, my wife's family and yeah, decorated the house for Christmas on Sunday, got the tree up, all that jazz. It's good. How's yours? I think it's, I think it's funny. You say the girls were bummed to go home early. I wonder how they would have felt if dad had been like, no, we're sticking it out. We're going to camp in this thunderstorm that's coming. <laughs> how would that have gone? I mean, I think they would have um, probably been thanking you. Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> it wouldn't have been fun at all. And if you remember last time we went camping, we had a very exciting, um, eventful night. So we just weren't up for that again. <laughs> yeah, I get it. But Cody, yeah. how was your Thanksgiving? Um, it was really fun. We went to uh, Los Angeles so and saw my parents and my brother and his wife. They live there. Um, it was uh, it was our first um, travel trip that like fun oh. travel trip that wasn't for business or anything else that we've done in um, two years. So like since the since, sorry, I call the pandemic, the pa the pandy. So, um, <laughs> this is probably inappropriate, but we, since the um, pandy, I like yeah, it since the, since the pandy started. So, um, it was really a fun trip to go and like, we stayed at this resort and like did resort things. So it was really fun. It was fun nice. to hang out with my family. Nice. Yeah. And in a warm climate. Oh yeah. It was beautiful. <laughs> I'm so jealous of the warmth. Michael has warmth too. And I I'm headed to warmer climbs next Friday. So I'm right behind you guys, but nice. <laughs> nice. And how was yours, Aaron? Your it friends. Was, giving. It was nice. Yes. Yeah. We had our friends giving, which I didn't realize this, but I had a Facebook memory pop up that said we, our first one was 10 years ago. So uh, I know I hadn't realized cool. we had this tradition for 10 years except for a couple times when it, you know, of course the pandy, um, interfered <laughs> with last year. And, and then we had another one that was canceled. So it had been a while since we'd done the friends giving, but, oh man, Matt and I were talking just on the way home from our gathering that we were like, that group is just so amazing. Like it's this mm. kind of hodgepodge of Canadians and other, um, you know, kind of foreigners. There's one of our friends is from great Britain who comes in. There's another, you know, group of friends. That's just like the three of them and the, all their families in California. And so they don't have anybody else here. And, and then there's like the big family of the hosts, you know, that all come and it just, mm -hmm. it feels so wonderful and inviting. So nice. we had a great time. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So I guess, um, maybe we should introduce Cody and tell everybody why she's here, even yeah. though she, you know, it, I mean, she, she needs no introduction in my, my <laughs> world, but we, we will introduce you. So, um, Cody is a cross country coach, uh, for Boise state university and a sports psychologist. And 
I met you, Cody, through a mutual running friend of ours. And we found out that we have this total love for food and nutrition and talk through all that stuff. Um, and I just, I appreciate your sense of humor and you're just an awesome person. So I, I love you for those reasons, but then I don't know how I didn't realize you have this wealth of knowledge in sports psychology, um, which we will get into. And that's what really piqued my interest for this discussion is just talking through some of your, um, expertise and your personal experience, not just as an accomplished runner yourself, but also a coach, um, your experience with the military, which is, you know, a whole nother layer of sports psychology, I think. And, um, yeah, I'm just really excited for this discussion and thank you so much for coming today. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, just one little point of clarification, just because it's like the law. So, um, I'm not actually a sports psychologist. Like I'm not a licensed psychologist. I have a master's degree oh. degree in sport and performance psychology. It's totally okay. Um, my <laughs> title is because this is going to be one of the questions, but, um, I'm a certified mental performance consultant. Um, and so, you know, I just think it's important to make sure that everybody knows that I'm, yes. Uh, like, like a, a psychologist is, um, someone who has been through like a ton of training. They've been through a doctoral program and they have like taken a test and done all these, um, clinical hours to be able to work with mental health and stuff like that. So there's a little bit, there's, there's a little bit of distinction between me and them, but, um, that's something that like just a little bit of distinction, um, so that we're all being ethical. I yes. Mean, thank you. So. Thank you. Oh, no for worries. That, no worries. That I think it's also correction. something that is like really common within our field because it's mm -hmm. an integrated field. So like just really common. Happens yeah. All the time. Well, and that was going to be one of my questions to you was what is a certified mental performance consultant, a CMPC, yeah. which is yeah. the article I read was explaining that you had, you know, that this was kind of your title. And so, yeah, that is a helpful distinction. And I think for our listeners too, just to know, you know, what kinds of credentials, Michael and I have talked about this in the, in the fitness and nutrition world before that it's important to know the credentials of the person mm -hmm. you're working with. Yeah. Um, so a certified mental performance consultant is a person who has, um, done, um, a, they, they have a master's or above level of education in either um, uh, sport and performance psychology or kinesiology or a related, a closely related field. And then, so they have like a, a foundational level of coursework and then they've done um, a, a certain level of mentored hours out in the field of applied sports psychology. Um, and then they also have taken a uh, a nationally recognized test, um, to be able to, uh, show that they have like a strong foundation of sport and performance psychology to be able to work with athletes and performers, uh, to help them perform at their best on a consistent basis. And the skills that they're looking for with, to be a certified mental performance consultant are, um, skills in areas like goal setting, uh, confidence, self-regulation, emotion, re emotional regulation, attention control, imagery, team building, um, coaching. Um, it's a wide variety of skills, but it's all in the idea that the consultant is going to be able to help performers, coaches, um, even parents, um, people within the performance uh, arena be able to like perform at their best um, and seek enjoyment on a regular and consistent basis. Wow. Um, yeah. you wow. said a lot of skills in there yeah. that <laughs> I want to dive into because there, I had a couple of questions about, can you explain, you know, mm -hmm. self-regulation and some of the other, what else did you, gosh, you rattled Imagery, off so many. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's a lot. <laughs> What are your, what are your top few favorites? <laughs> what are my favorite skills? Yeah. Um, my favorite, oh, man, you know, what's really weird. 
like this is kind of weird, but I think that my favorite skills, they like rotate. I have like a rotational basis of like, uh-huh. that like skills that I'm like, Oh, I love you today. Skill. I love you today. Skill. <laughs> um, or sometimes like, a, like an athlete will do something and I'm like, Oh, I love that you're doing that. Um, recently I had someone in a group, um, start just talking about imagery and they were talking about imagery so perfectly, like, uh, like almost according to the definition of imagery that I suddenly (laughs) fell back in love with imagery again, you know, like, and how they (laughs) used it and the, the like definitions of it. And all of a sudden I was like all about imagery again. Um, and then I, I had another group of like our, one of our teams was really working on attention control and focusing throughout the entire race. Um, they have to, so our guys team, they have to run, um, for like 25 to 28 minutes, um, which they do a, an 8k and a 10k and focusing your mind for like a, six miles, I think it's yeah. just like really hard. Like your body is hurting <laughs> your focus and they were really trying to learn attention control skills. And I think what makes me really like certain skills is when I see the performer working to try to learn them. Mm, Yeah. That that really gets me like, I'm like, Oh, they're into it. So I'm into into (laughs) it. Like that makes Mm. me get really into skills. Like when I see some, like the skills are just the skills, but when I see people trying to apply them, then I'm like, Oh, this is so neat. Um, mm-hmm. sure. so I have like a rotational basis of the skills. <laughs> That's good. You don't play favorites. <laughs> Probably not. Um, there's none that I think are boring. Yeah. That's good. Well, and I think that that's the sign of a good coach or teacher or mentor is when you, your passion for what you do is ignited by watching other people learn Mm -hmm. it and apply it and realize some, some potential there, or, um, you know, kind of discovering why it's important and how they can apply it in their lives. Mm -hmm. So how did you get into this work? Like, uh, tell us a little background back in the days of before Cody knew much about, you know, performance psychology. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that I got into sport and performance psychology because um, when I was an athlete in college, I did did track and field and cross country from the time I was in eighth grade. I started doing it in eighth grade and then I did it all through high school. And then I I was a um, division one athlete at Arizona State um, with track and field and cross country. And they're really at the same like parallel process. That was when sport and performance psychology was coming up. So there wasn't a lot of access to, um, these resources. And, but I knew that inherently I probably would have benefited from them. Um, and when I got done, like, as I was developing in my own career path, I was thinking to myself, like, what is it that really makes me passionate? And I really enjoy doing sports and and wanting to be around sports, but I kind of didn't want to just do traditional coaching. Um, and so I literally just, uh, and in my, like stepping back two steps when I was young, young, like a youth athlete, I had gone to the Olympic training center, um, and I had been exposed to imagery. Oh, cool. um, Mm -hmm. At at the Olympic Training Center. And so I knew like what skills were, but not the term sports psychologist. And um, so I kind of just like Googled what is the mental side of performance. (laughs) And (laughs) lo and behold, like I, the, there was a job for this. And I looked up like programs and got into it. And, um, I took a, I took like a very, speaking of like middle-ish, I took kind of like a balanced approach to it. I had throughout my entire college career, this is, I don't want to make it a long story, but I had not taken one psychology class, which I don't know how I did that because it's in general (laughs) studies. Yeah. (laughs) I don't know how I managed to not do that, but I went back to um, community college and took general psychology, developmental psychology and stats. And I was like, whoa, 
I love this. It is so mm-hmm. fun. And after that, I just kind of took a risk and looked up programs that I thought would match me and took a risk and took like almost like a 180 in my career to start doing sports psychology because what I thought about was my passions and my strengths and that I wanted to be like working with performers and athletes every day. Like I was like, I could do this every day. I want to be around sports, talking about sports, working with sports every day. Um, What am I passionate about? And that's, that's how I got into it was kind of just following what I was really passionate about and into. I think it's cool that you just Googled the mental side of sports. (laughs) Like, oh, there's a job here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I the power of Google. Right. <laughs> Sometimes you gotta, I think, I think that you have to start smaller and then go broader and broader with what you're looking for sometimes. Huh? And and that has helped me a lot. So we I think I don't know if we're leading up to your experience in the military or your interest there, but how does that, because I have a feeling, I mean, we think of sports performance as being like the athletes, right? Like the track and field Mm -hmm. at BSU, or I'm, I'm a triathlete, you know, Michael works a lot with like goal setting and that kind of thing. But the military is actually a huge component of Mm -hmm. performance psychology, Mm -hmm. right? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the, the military right now is, um, one of the largest hirers of, of sport and performance psychology workers and consultants. Um, there's a lot of really big contracts out there and it's across, it used to just be, um, it started out just in the army as, as the only branch, but now all the branches of the military have, um, performance consultants at some, Mm. at some level. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a really, really consistent work. It's good work. And, um, I think that it's a good place for people to get involved. Um, and the way that I got involved with it was, um, you know, like it's kind of interesting cause sort of, it, I didn't Google it, but, um, I, <laughs> I like when I first got into sport and performance psychology, like my goal, when I first got into it was, um, really, really narrow. Like I, I wanted to work with track and field and cross country. And I wanted to work with like Olympic level athletes. Like I was really Mm. specific and it was so specific that it probably was limiting. Um, and then as I went through my, uh, master's program, they had these really cool, like brown bag lunches, like lunch and learns or whatever. And, um, they also, where they would have people that were working in the field come in and talk to us about what they were doing. And when the people came in and told us what from, we had people that were already working in the, in the military and I thought the jobs were fascinating. And then the more that I did my program, they also exposed us to different aspects that you can do in sport and performance psychology. So you can do applied work where you're doing direct inter- interventions with the, with the performers you can do research Mm -hmm. um, and then you can do like a blend of both. And the more that I did my program, the more that I realized, oh, I really like working, doing applied work. So it was almost like I went from really specific and narrowed down to broad. Mm. And when I got done with my program, it was, I could not find a job with track and field. Like I was not uh, experienced enough. There was a limited, there was like five jobs and that was compared right. with everybody else um, <laughs> that were way more experienced than me. But so I broadened my search more like the Google situation to be like, what if I really want to do applied work, where could I do that? And the military came up and that's mm-hmm. how I got into working with the military because oh. it was more the idea of being able to get applied experience mm-hmm. with a population that with, with populations, like I went more to the idea of doing experiences and the population, I kind of let the population go for a little while. And I'm so glad that I did. It was just the most rewarding work that I've ever done. Hmm. Oh, wow. How long did you do that? I did it for almost seven years, like yeah, over six years. 
Okay. Yeah. That's so you, I mean, it was more than just a stepping stone. It That's was. a pretty significant piece of your career. It yeah. was, it was more than the stepping stone. It was like a place where I just talked to one of my friends that, that worked there. And he was like, it felt like home. It was, it was like, mm-hmm. just, I loved it. Um, it was, it was super rewarding. Yeah. And so this was with team red, white, and blue. Is that right? Uh, that was no, was it was a program. Um, um, it was, it, it was called comprehensive soldier and family fitness at the time. Oh, okay. Um, and then once I, I left the military and I went and worked for a veteran service organization called team red, white, and blue. Mm-hmm. Okay. At, oh, at want, comprehensive, oh, sorry. oh, sorry. At Comprehensive no, Soldier and Family Fitness, I worked with um, active duty soldiers and Team Red, White, and Blue was all veterans. Okay. Oh, got it. Okay. And then, so are you a veteran? Were you in the military no. or were you oh, civilian no. the whole time? Okay. Civilian contractor. Okay. Got it. Um, so going back to all those skills you mentioned um, briefly. So working now with, you know, athletes at Boise State, mm-hmm. are there and this is just my own curiosity, I guess, but of those list of skills, are there ones that you see athletes tend to excel at the most or grab mm-hmm. a hold of quickly? And are there ones that tend to be more of a struggle or they, they kind of just have a harder time kind of mm-hmm. adopting and practicing? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think that they, um, so in my population, um, some of the skills that they gravitated towards really quickly um, was uh, mindfulness. Um, we okay. did, they really liked mindfulness. Um, we did like a semester, so like 12 weeks of, of just like introduction to mindfulness and um, being present. So mindfulness has to do with like being present focused and working on attention. Um, and it was challenging for them, but it was also like, really thought provoking and mm-hmm. like they, I saw them practicing it and it was very applicable to them. Mm-hmm. So I think more of like the present focused and like attention based skills, um, my population of, of athletes, I think they, they work really well in it. Um, and I'm, I have a suspicion as to why I think that works for them. Um, with endurance athletes, they are like, the it's an open ended process versus like gymnastics where there's like closed loop skills. And so, so like they have to be used to, they have to come to grips with like, this is going to be painful yeah and accepting that. And so mindfulness works with like the acceptance of where I am in the present moment versus jumping to the end of like, this is going to be terrible, or this is like, what is the end going to be? And so they really took to mindfulness, I think, because they, because I was working with them. The thing that they want to learn is how to be present focused. Right. I can relate Um, to that for sure. Yeah. Like if you're an endurance athlete, um, but I think some of the more like closed loop athletes, they do better with um, different skills actually. Um, And then the skills that I think that they don't actually take to, or that they struggle with or push back on more are, um, energy management Mm. skills. Um, and those are again, like going towards like the idea of like finding balance. Um, they don't want to take, they, they, they don't, they have a little bit of a harder time. I think, uh, with like, um, c- conceptualizing like how rest matters, the, like the, the idea of like sure. pushing, 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 and then putting energy back into the tank and like techniques to actually put energy back into the tank. And what mm. does that actually mean? Um, I think that they struggle a little bit with that because, um, they, the value systems that are involved with endurance sports are, miles matter. yeah yeah I can see that. dig work, harder dig deeper dig harder. Yep. work matters work matters yeah that and we actually, see that a lot i think Aaron, yeah. i see that too with clients is there's there's such a high emphasis on the work and the effort and then we just don't put really much priority in rest and recovery and really they're the same 
coin, just different sides. And just, they're both, you know, have just as much value as the other, but we don't prioritize them equally in our society. And that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. They are able to talk about it, Mm -hmm. but um, the actual, when it's the actual application of like, we're going to take away some of these miles for you to (laughs) put, um, to put energy back into the tank. Um, it is, it is a real, you know, you asked me at the very beginning about like cognitive awareness, the the cognitive awareness, a piece of it is, is a big stinger. They, they really, oh no, oh no. And they'll, they, I've seen, and it's not just on our team, but I've seen like a lot of performers, they'll want to point it out, like, you know, Aaron should do this. But like Michael, <laughs> like me, Michael, I'm not going to do it. Like they, right. they want to see right. someone else do it, but like they can, yeah. they can reflect it. But when it's reflected back on them, it's really mm-hmm. challenging. God. And don't we do that? We tend to do that as humans oh, anyway. Yeah. Like yeah. Michael and yeah. I always are poking fun at ourselves for talking about so many of these things. And then we're like, and it's really, mm-hmm. really hard. And it's really shitty sometimes to convince yourself that you need to do this. So I'm curious then how you help people lean into that or experience it, or at least try it on for a size that whole, like, let's put some back in the tank, because I would imagine that most athletes or performers would see that as weakness. Like anytime Mm -hmm. you're holding back a little bit and not pushing, you're being weak or you're giving up. I know that manifested in me a few times when I would be like, God, I know I need to kind of pull back here, but oh, it feels shitty. Like I'm weak and I'm not, I should be able to handle this. Like I shit all over myself. So I'm just curious, like how you coach. And that was should S H O U L D. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But I just, I'm curious how you coach people through that or what kinds of approaches you have. Um, I think that the first, sometimes we sit and like just talking about it and, um, yeah, I think sometimes we, so one of the first, like, it seems really basic, but it can be really complex, uh, um, is steps is self-awareness. So like, talking, sitting and talking about it, um, and exploring our value system and exploring our thoughts about it, it can be, and I got like one thing about me and the specialness about me is that I have the time to actually sit and talk with people. Like my specialty is, is that we're just going to talk about it. So, so like, we can spend a lot of time in self-awareness and exploring like this, this concept of, of why do we do that? Why does it like, what is the effectiveness of it? Like, how do you feel about it? Like, Mm -hmm. like, what is that? What does it make you actually do? Um, what part of my approach is strongly based in CBT. So cognitive, Mm. um, behavioral therapy. And so, you know, like our thoughts drive our feelings and and emotions and then like our physiology and then our behavior. And so I'll try to sit with the the performer and say like, what is the event? Like, what is, what are you, what's dry, what is actually happening? That's just the event. And then what is our feelings and emotions? And sometimes we just have to sit there for a little bit more time than what we normally give it process, give in normal conversation. And I think that one way that I do it that I work with athletes is saying like, Hey, why are we actually doing this? Is it effective? Like maybe asking a few more questions of like, is this effective? Is it what you really want? Is it giving you what you really want to your end goal? So like maybe even starting out with like, this is what you said your goal was at the top. This is what you're actually doing. And is there congruence between the two of them? Mm -hmm. And is it effective? So sometimes I'm also a challenger. Like, that's good. We could all use friend. Friend. Yeah. 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 We could all use a little, a little challenging. Um, I like that you mentioned that you build that self-awareness maybe by sitting with things a little bit longer and talking about them a little bit more than you would in just standard conversation, because I feel like that's kind of where a lot of people 
struggle is that being, and we've, we've done topics on this, like leaning into discomfort. We talked about that one. Um, we've done topics on just kind of sitting with why certain things make you feel a certain way or like what that, what that event is that triggered that feeling. Mm -hmm. And how have you normally reacted to that feeling? Mm -hmm. How can you then take a different action or what are the possibilities like opening it up? So they kind of can see that there are other ways to behave based mm -hmm. on that feeling. Is that kind yeah, of yeah. Like yeah. I think, um, part of what I try to do with them is see that, that like, there's not is maybe a creative process as well is that there's not just mm. uh, like a step stone, you know, process of doing things right. is that you could have a more like wiggly road to get to success. Um, and that, um, also they have the opportunity in sessions with me to explore different, op different processes and methods and means to get to the end that they're trying to get to. Um, and that might feel uncomfortable because they might have been socialized or seen someone else get to success. So kind of like what you were saying, Aaron, about like mm -hmm. the shoulds, like sometimes the shoulds mm -hmm. come from like, I saw someone else do this, or it was presented to me in this way, or a coach told me that it, this is the only way to do it. But it's not always the, that's, that's the only way it's that the coach is that, that that's the coach's philosophy. Right. Mm -hmm. So like you need to kind of break down in sessions with a sports psychology consultant and have like almost say the, my favorite thing is that like, take down the walls. You're not in a four walls. You have like all these different options and let's explore all of them and see what's realistic to get to the end goal, because it's not, there isn't just one way to skin the cat. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Um, and this kind of goes into what you and I had discussed when we chatted on the phone a few weeks back where you kind of, you were saying how sometimes there's this, um, approach. I kind of took some notes here, like we're going into battle like that, you know, maybe think of that hard line German, like you're just you fight through it with everything you got versus this sort of trickster. And like you mentioned, like looking at it as creative and, sort of this artistic almost approach, which I think was a really unique way of kind of describing this mm -hmm. psychological work. Mm -hmm. So tell us more about that. Yeah. So I printed it out because I wanted to, oh, I think I'm a big brilliant. Person. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> um, so I, um, I think that this is, and everybody's going to have like their own philosophy, but this is my, I think that it's really important to that athletes and performers, like they're making a creative product, right? Like it's so important. They're doing something that is part of coming from their own. So many athletes are, and performers are coming from a place of like internal motivation and it's a part of themselves where, whether they're doing like, um, gymnastics or volleyball or, or even like in the military, like I saw like the military population, I saw people they're uh, extremely purpose-driven um, organization. You can't get by in the organization without feeling a sense of purpose. And um, so I saw this, this article from Elizabeth Gilbert who wrote Eat, Pray, Love. Um, and she did a interview and she said um, this thing about German romanticism. So German romanticism has an obsession with creative misery and the icon of the tormented artist. And I think that in athletics and performance, we also have an idea of like, you must suffer for your craft. Like German romanticism mm. is very much like, oh, if I if I didn't suffer in some way, then I didn't actually, did I actually create something great? Yeah. Mm. Um, and the nightmare of artistic torment is the ethic that says that our suffering shall be our badge of honor as artists and that our genius will ultimately destroy us. It's a dark path, a path of battle, sadomasochistic self-violence, and its legacy is a long list of artists who put, who are always killing themselves again and again all day long. And I, I think that there is very much like in sports and performance, there can be a, like, that is what greatness is. Like you see a lot mm -hmm. of imagery that goes right. with that. 
Um, but there, so then do you, I think that for myself, something that I would like for my athletes to explore is that there are other ways to do this. And what she says is there is another way to be, to be creative. That does not make a fetish out of suffering an older way, a richer way. Um, the way human beings have been making art for 30,000 years before Europeans started taking things all too seriously. <laughs> this is the path of playful collaboration with the mysteries of in inspiration. The path that says you are neither slave to your muse nor its master, but that you are its partner and that the two of you, artistic mystery and you can delight in each other. It's the path that says creativity is a weird but never boring dance and that you are allowed to actually enjoy it regardless of how it turns out. And I wow. think that that is like, isn't that like, yes, I think it's like, I love it cr crazy. And that instead of being like the warrior all the time, you could be the coyote or the monkey that is like mm -hmm. playing in your craft. Mm -hmm. And yes, what I really, my own philosophy that I try to like go from at the very beginning when a performer comes into my office is that like we want to um that you are not the slave to your muse or its master and that you are the partner and that you are making create that, that this is creativity and that you're allowed to enjoy the process no matter how it turns out that we're trying to find joy in the process no matter how it turns out mm -hmm. because i I have seen performers in like the military and in athletics that they like lost that joy and that then they lost like the internal motivation that brought them to the place in the first place. And, and like, that's not what, that's, that's not why I got yeah. into the profession. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's great. Wow. And that goes that directly piece of into not being what a we've slave talked about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the part that really stood out to me. Yeah. The, and Michael, you talk a lot about like when people like white knuckling it through, mm -hmm. you know, like you're always just like gripping yourself and trying harder and harder and fighting it. And so this is like right along with many themes we've talked about. Yeah. Well, I just, mm -hmm. I, I've always liked the idea of just telling clients, like, let's be curious. Let's see what's out yeah. there for you. Yeah. Like yeah. who knows what's going to stick? I don't, you know, like, yeah. I mean, if a coach says they do that they're wrong, you know, like we got to play around with stuff and find out. And, and, mm -hmm. and I think when people can approach it with that, not, I've got to get it right the first time, like we typically do, but like, let's try some shit, you know, and yeah. see what happens. And yeah, eventually you'll work your way to some things that I think stick. That's, that's great. I, man, I love yeah. that. hearing that. Yeah. I really like that. I like that too, is that like, this is creativity and, and like mm -hmm. for a lot of people, a lot of like athletes or performers like this is where you are are like people say it to me all the time like this is where I experience freedom so if you're white knuckling it like you stole the freedom from from your yeah mm -hmm. um this is where you feel like a little while ago I was doing a long run and I felt so free that I was like had my little jaybirds in and I was running and I felt so free that I was like literally running with like with your arms, arms out, out. Like, <laughs> and, and, and I was like, I'm neither slave nor, nor master of my art right now. Like, but this is where my body feels free. And like, I want that for all my athletes, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, like some of my yeah. soldiers, like they gotta like jump out of planes and like throw explosives that go like, boom, you know, like, <laughs> I mean, like they should feel like that's so, yeah. you know, yeah. so so mm -hmm. you mentioned you were on a long run recently and we haven't talked about your athletic career, which is actually yeah. pretty damn impressive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. I know you're going to be modest, but, um, <laughs> in inducted into what the Indiana XC hall of fame. Did I get that right? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. It's just, um, oh, oh yeah. That sure. thing. I, um, so I mean, I, damn, <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, yeah, that. <laughs> So the Indiana Cross Country Hall of Fame, it's like, uh, like, I don't know what to say. But, um, I ran cross country in Indiana and um, it was like, um, our team was really good. Our team was, was really good. We were like three times state champions. Um, and um, I think that um, 
then when I was a senior, I was um, fifth, fifth in the state. So like, I kind of went like up through when I was a sophomore, I was like all state. And then, then I like got, did a little better. And then when I was a senior, I, I, that was like my best year and I was in the top five. And so then like, if you were in the top five, then you get inducted into the, into the um, hall of fame. Um, and um, I don't know, it was really neat. Like, I think it was so cool. I got to go, we got to go. Like my husband and I went to the state meet and um, Indiana cross country is like some of the best, I think in America. Like, wow. I, I, I like mm. firmly believe this. They, a lot of cross country now is, um, all like, it's all in the classes and divisions, but, but they like keep it old school and everybody runs one meet. So like you, you could be from a really small school and be an all like champion above everybody. And there's like two, 250 kids that run 10,000 people come to the state meet. So you're just wow. ah, like, right. <laughs> racing, cheering in your, and it was like Halloween weekend. There was like grapes in costume, like a banana ran by me. <laughs> what? Um, I love it. The, the, the thing that I really loved about going and I liked getting the jacket. Like I love awards. I, I love that kind of thing. But um, they, I really liked going. My husband had never seen a cross country meet before. That was his first time. Oh. Um, and I loved seeing him like, what is this? What is going on? <laughs> um, and then um, cross country like it, I had a really positive experience in high school. Mm -hmm. And so then like seeing it again and seeing other people, they were still having a positive experience. And Mm. like, that made me like, I'm still running in part because of like my coaches, my teammate, my parents, like that experience was so positive for me that it made me like keep on running through college. It made me keep on running now because it was so positive. And then going back and seeing like, it's still so positive. I really liked, I really liked seeing that. That's awesome. it was worth it. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I have never heard anyone say the sentence, a banana ran by me. So that's a first for me, Cody. There was, there was like, I, I think like seeing people run by, like there was like a full set of fruit dressed up. Like there was some it's grapes and apple. Yeah. And, and they were all cheering for their teammates. Like they hadn't, they weren't that's racing, awesome. but they were oh there. Oh my gosh. <laughs> too and it was like cold and rainy i'm sure they were cold that's cool. um, <laughs> not if you're wearing a banana costume i'm sure you're protected <laughs> from the cold yeah. i don't know if it was like wind resistant i don't know <laughs> so you Fine. mentioned um the sustainability piece and this i want to kind of bring it full circle because i think it's important for our audience to hear that you are an accomplished athlete and you ran in college and you you know took it very seriously in high school and now you're working with athletes and you have found a way to sustain your joy of running which i think kind of brings this whole conversation full circle because a huge part of what you do is finding that like you just said you know what what brought us to this place to perform in these ways in the first place. So I'm curious, maybe, you know, how you have found that sustainability in yourself and, and maybe when things clicked in this, like applying the sports psychology practices to yourself. Was that Um, a clear question or did I like just, (laughs) well, I think there might be two questions, so I'll try to, but I'll try to not talk too much, but like, I think that, um, my, I think that sustainability for me is that, um, like athletics, um, is constantly changing. Right. So like when you're at one level, you're like, if you're at the, um, if you're at the college level, then you're trying to get to one set of goals. Like I I really want to be an all American. I really want to be a national champion. I really want this. Um, and then when you get to be like a post-collegiate, you are either, it's not either, or I shouldn't say it, but like, you might be, um, trying to work on becoming like a pro or semi-pro and then, and then like the greatest thing about athletics and I think, and especially like endurance 
sports is that there's always something else that you can be focusing on to achieve mastery within your events. Mm -hmm. And the part that is sustainability to me is that you can, if you look at it that way, you can always be finding something else to be working on. So for me, the sustainability aspect of it is that like, I have been able to um, find different aspects of mastery. Um, Like there isn't probably for myself, it's not going to be likely that I'm going to be able to get to PRs at this point in time. So, but like the sustainability aspect for me is that, or the mastery aspect is that I can still be competitive. So like practicing competitive habits and also practicing things that um, in my youth, I was <laughs> re- had a really hard time with things like self-regulation um, mm. and, fo- and focus, which I, st- I see my kids now and I'm like, you should practice this now because you'll be better at it. But, um, <laughs> th- but like, I, like when I see myself execute a race plan, exactly how I said I wanted to, how I talked with my coach, how I visualized it, and then I go and I do it. That is, that is like, "Mm, I'm so happy. What, regardless of what my time was, because that those are hard skills. And that Mm -hmm. goes to your question about like sports psychology. Like those are all mental. That's all mental toughness. And so no matter what my time is, if I execute those process skills, like I know I did strong work. Mm. Yeah. And so like, as you do, like, I might not get a lot of like PRs at this point and that's okay for me because there's other things that I can work on in terms of like mastery of hard skills, executing training plans, communicating properly with my coach. That, that was really hard for me. Mm-hmm. Um, coming to consensus of what we want to do and then coming back and getting feedback on it. Like if I do that, I'm, yeah, mm, I did a good work. Yeah. Um, coming back from injuries. Like I had a, I had some like major health issues and like building back up and being like, no, I can still work out hard. So I think that there's things that you can do to sustain in the sport. If you are focused, if you're only focused on PRs, you won't be sustainable. Yeah. Yeah. And so what I hear you saying is that a a huge piece of sustainability lies in letting the goalposts move as you need to. Yeah. And, and, and not fixating on only one thing, but as life changes and adapts, then maybe we have different priorities. And that if we try to only focus on the priorities we had previously, sustainability might not be an option. You won't, you won't. I think, I think like there was a little like, um, acronym that they had in the army called, it was called VUCA and it was volatile, uncertain, changing and adaptable. And like, (laughs) I think that sustainability comes from Mm. like what you're saying, Michael, that, that you have to let the goalposts change because if you, the world is, is volatile, uncertain, yeah. changing, and, and you have to be adaptable in it. And like, yeah. if, 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 if I'm like become unsatisfied with like, I'm not getting a PR up, I'm never going to be able to get to that 17 minutes that I've been trying to get in the 5k. Like I'll, I'll quit the game, mm-hmm. but the game brings me tons of satisfaction. Like my runs right. bring me so much satisfaction, you know, I'd be sad. Yeah. 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 You, um, I, I love this because I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, call you out on one of the things you told us on your little bio is that you love trophies. I do. You love trophies. And I find that, I think a lot of people would be like, well, wait a minute. You just fed us this line about loving the process and not getting too tied to the outcomes or whatever, but you <laughs> love trophies. Um, tell us about this gold pan trophy that you're obsessed with. Um, okay. So I, um, there's a race in Colorado. I highly recommend people do it. It's not like, it's been around for a little while. Um, and some, there's a few races on top of it now, so it doesn't get as much hype, but, um, it's the Georgetown to Idaho Springs half marathon. And it's like a really lovely race. And, 
um, it goes from 8,000 to 7,000 feet. So it's a net downhill. So you can get okay. good times at it, but it is at altitude. And the award for it is like, so Colorado, it is a um, little gold pan because in Idaho Springs, that's a gold panning town and it has a little geode in it. And then on top of it, it has a little hand carved um, bighorn sheep because bighorn sheep are also like at like in that area, it's totally appropriate. And <laughs> I just got it in my head that like, I wanted to win this trophy. And, um, but the race was at the time was like super competitive. And so the first time I signed up for it, I like didn't prepare enough. And I, I got like fourth or fifth. So I was just out of this stupid, didn't get it. I had to stand there and watch everybody get their pans. <laughs> so then I came back and like, I, it took me three times to get the trophy. Like each year something happened. Um, there was an unfortunate incident. I won't go into it, but the second year that I was totally prepared and I, there was an unfortunate incident with a line at the bathrooms and I was behind, I didn't go off oh, with the gun and I didn't no. get it. Um, and so then I was, I was yeah. in it, I, but I, they did it by gun time and I didn't get it. Um, oh. I know. So then the third year I finally got it, but, um, Yay. I know. Yes, finally. And, awesome. um, I think that I, also, I love trophies, but I love like, I, I did just do this whole thing about the process. And I think that they are tied together. Like in that time period, I also dropped like 15 minutes in that three years off my half marathon time. And I went, oh, from dang. Like, yeah, I went from like Jeez. a 137 to a 120 half marathon at altitude. Um, and wow, that's I, smoking fast. If I y'all mean, don't know, like yeah, that's, that's fast. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, again, like learned, um, you know, those two times that I didn't get it. Um, I learned about like, um, sticking to a race, but I had a lot of problems with like getting into races. And, um, if, if the trophy was there, I would get really distracted and I would start doing your race plan, not my own. And then I would mm. fail. So I had to learn like doing my own race plan all the way through to the end, which mm -hmm. is a self-regulatory process. Um, mm. And I did that and guess what? I still didn't get the trophy, mm -hmm. but I was so happy because that was the time when I dropped 10 minutes, 10 minutes off my time. That's a, that's a minute yeah. per, mi per yeah. mile. Like that's ridiculous. That's um, I learned about do finding and doing my own, like my own training plan and sticking to it. Um, I learned about like fueling. I learned about asking for help. Like I learned, and now I can tell you guys about all these things that I learned. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. so when I finally got the gold pan, it was like representative of all these things that I learned. And, um, I learned about like picking appropriate races that were challenging and satisfying, right? Like I stopped doing flat, fast courses because like they were so boring. I could not stand them and I never raced well on them. So I also learned about like my own strengths and listening to myself. Like the trophy is great and I love it, but like, I don't pick just races just because like, oh, this one's really awesome. Like I picked ones, I started picking places that were like appropriate for me. Mm -hmm. um, and the final thing that I'll say about it is that I think that for myself and for athletes, um, in the United States, I think we have a background, a history of coming from a Puritan background. This is that we were made by Puritans, right? Like, and which has a value of being humble mm -hmm. and being humble is great. But again, like back to the, one of the things that you guys talk about is like finding balance. It's not all or nothing, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, you can be humble but if, if you're not humble, that doesn't mean that, um, you're arrogant and people like Michael Jordan knew his strengths mm -hmm. and he said his strengths and he relished in his strengths and he celebrated his strengths. Um, the U S women's national team, they unabashedly said that they knew their value. They knew their worth and they loved winning. 
And that was one of the things that separated them. They loved winning. And that is an arrogance that's knowing your value. And I think that I want my, all of my performers to be like, I love success. I love hard work. I see value in it. And I know my worth. Mm -hmm. And that is an arrogance that is confidence. Mm -hmm. And I am not afraid to share my success with others. And the people that love me will be like, you're, you're right. Yeah. And mm-hmm. also I'll challenge you. I'll race you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> like I want to be around people and I want my athletes to be around people that aren't like, that's arrogant, but instead be like, you want to win. I also want to win. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I love it. Um, oh, wow. I feel like that just kind of put a bow on, on yeah. everything. Um, I have a couple like fun rapid fire questions for you, Cody, okay. if you're game. Yeah, no. Um, I, love I don't know challenge. my, oh yeah. Well, yeah, these are not very challenging. This is, <laughs> I think you're going to ace this. Well, they might be, you never know. Mm. <laughs> and maybe Michael, you, you might've come up with your own, but um, okay. So we're heading into winter. I'm curious <clears throat> if you prefer to spend winter days cozy by a fire under a blanket or playing out in the snow. Mm. Cozy by a cozy by the fire. I think Heidi. Yeah. <laughs> with, with your kitties, right? Cody yes, fosters kitties, mm-hmm. <laughs> which makes me love you even more. Yeah. <laughs> um, What's your least favorite household chore? Oh my God. Cooking or cleaning. Ah, We've talked about this. (laughs) (laughs) I outsource cleaning cleaning. or cleaning. (laughs) I outsource cleaning and I, um, we get, we've been, we've been like, um, loyal Sunbasket fans for years and years. Nice. (laughs) Um, let's see. Well, so that might answer the next question. Exceptional takeout or exceptional homemade? Oh, um, well, my husband is a really good cook. So I think exceptional homemade. Okay. As long as you're not making it. As long as I am served. (laughs) So bad. So bad. (laughs) That's all that matters, right? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Um, what's your favorite Christmas tradition? Um, well, we, my husband and I buy these little like German houses. Um, we started getting them in, we went to this German market and, um, or the, we did Germany Christmas in Germany and one year, and we started buying these little houses and now we buy them. And I love, like, I love the little Christmas markets or, or the little Christmas houses. Um, they're like little lighthouses that you put a candle in and I like oh, right. those little houses. Nice. Um, it seemed really corny. I totally did not think that I would be a little German house lady, but I totally <laughs> am. And I, I like love those little houses. I love shopping for them. Everything's in German. I pick it out. I we're getting to the point where we have sprawl. I was just going <laughs> to wonder, like, are you expanding the way Boise is expanding with your yeah, German yeah. village? <laughs> yeah. We're getting to the point where we're having a conversation about that, but you can buy little people for them. So like we're, we're oh, trying dear. to bring more, we're trying to entice more people to our village. <laughs> It's a little commune. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. Do you have? Well, I do have one last little question, and then we'll move on to. I don't think I warned you about this. We do meaning in the mundane every week, so we talk about one little moment in our our week um, that was, you know, joyful or introspective, or that we um, served a purpose more than just like this seemingly ordinary moment. Okay. So, but before that, I just have one last question what would you say to our audience members who are like, oh, well, she's a lifetime athlete. She has all this knowledge. She has been learning psychology for so long. I don't even know where to begin with my health goals. How does this apply to me? Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I think that I have three tips, three little tips. Um, the first one is, um, set goals. Um, because, and these are, these are evidence-based tips. So they're, they're not just coming from my 
from my mind. <laughs> but um, so I think um, setting setting a goal that is um, challenging but also realistic for you. Um, and the goal goal setting um, helps provide direction focus and motivation for us. Um, and so sometimes when we're starting out and we're new at something, it can seem like so overwhelming and there's like no walls around anything. But if you set a goal, then it also provides like steps. It's kind of like um, mapping out your destination um, when you're going on a trip. So like when you put your destination into your Google maps or whatever, and it tells you the steps to get there, it also shows you like the direction and how far you've come. And so I think that mm. Um, setting a goal can uh, provide that for you. Um, and there's many different goal setting apps. There's a lot of different ways that you can help with that. You can mm -hmm. reach out to a CMPC. You can reach out to like, you can get a lot of help for that. Um, and it doesn't have to be complex, but just set a goal. And that helps frame in kind of like where you want to go and it gives you purpose and direction. Um, the second thing that we talked a little bit about is um, I think that getting um, some sort of social support. Um, there's a lot of the other thing that I teach and, and have done work in is resilience. And there is a lot of literature out there that um, one of the like skills that helps with resilience and um, coming back from setbacks is having just like a few people in your circle. Um, it can be a teacher, it can be a mentor, it can be a friend, it, 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 it doesn't necessarily matter who it is, but so people who support you. So tell a, a couple people about your goal. Um, people that are going to be like, yes, you can. Um, kind of like Megan Rapino and the, um, the women's national team, like those people all, all kind of were like, yes, we can. And I believe in this goal. Like, I believe in you. And then um, the third thing is, is um, we talked a lot about this, like celebrate your successes, um, look back and track your successes and um, don't be afraid to celebrate and share your successes along the way. Um, oh, I guess I have a fourth one, but um, is, <laughs> is like be flexible. We talked about flexibility. Yeah. So sometimes when you're new at things, you might say like, I'm going to attain this goal in like six months. Or, and if you don't get it in six months or along the timeline, or you have a setback, that can be because of a number of reasons. So you might have to, that might not be your fault, or it can be because you're new at it. So be flexible because like time is kind of like a river, right? Like you might need to adjust it because of like priority shifting or um, a mistake or an injury. So be flexible just because you didn't get it in that timeline that you suggested, like be flexible along the way and that 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 can really help like give yourself grace give yourself grace and give yourself joy i love it yeah awesome. can be applied to anything in our yeah, lives sure. um, um so meaning in the mundane what do we do you want me to go first i'll go first sure. i'm not one chambered and ready chambered <laughs> 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 Ready, fire. Uh, Boise is experiencing an inversion, which for those of you who are not familiar, it's when we have hot air on top of cold air and it basically holds all of the gray, like kind of icky smogginess down here in the valley, which usually makes for like gray days and just kind of, uh, I can see the sun where I'm at right now. But the best part about the inversion is the sunrises and sunsets because we've had some amazing ones lately. And I have taken to, so we, our new house has a double story. And so I'll go upstairs and just look out the window at the sunrise or the sunset and just stand nice. there and, and enjoy it because we've always lived down, you know, where you can't, you don't get a great view of it because you're down, mm -hmm. you know, with like trees and houses and stuff kind of blocking. And so that has been my new favorite activity as of late is just to go <laughs> sit upstairs in one of the windows Excellent. and enjoy the sunrise or sunset. We had a gorgeous one this morning and I stood in the spare bedroom window and just watched the sunrise for, I don't know, 10 minutes or something. It's nice. wonderful. Love it. Mm -hmm. Sunrises and sunsets are Always and I mean, magical, how many times they? do you, yeah, you don't really take the time to right. like maybe with like a partner or something, or if you're like on mm -hmm. a beach or somewhere romantic, you might do that. But I mean, how many people just sit in their houses and right. <laughs> watch the sunrise or sunset? Not super often. Yeah. It's been wonderful. 
so for me, mine was Sunday, um, two days ago. We uh, we decorated our house and then we we decorated our tree, which is always like a it's one of my favorite um, Christmas. Uh, what's the word? Uh, Tradition traditions there it is i cannot think of the word uh because we kind of make a whole big thing about it you know we have like this spread of like appetizers and stuff and punch and we put on christmas mm. music and we put up the tree and we all take the girls have their own ornaments and they hang theirs and we hang ours and it's just this really fun tradition that um, i always look forward to a whole lot and it just feels kind of magical it's how i did things as a kid with my family so it's always it's like real nostalgic too and uh, we got to do that on Sunday and it was just a really nice end to a, a nice weekend. And yeah, that was fine. I love it. I like that you make it a thing like, Hey, let's have some appetizers and some drinks mm-hmm. and music and let's do like a party. <laughs> that sounds yeah. awesome. <laughs> Lila, Lila, she calls it the feast. Like, are we going to have oh, a I feast? Love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Super fun. Um, I think mine is. Um, so when we were in California, um, I wanted to like do some runs or runs along the ocean. And, um, my sister-in-law has been like, she's, she always says like my, she's there, she's French Canadian. So she has like this French voice that I won't try to do for you now, but (laughs) just imagine it in a French accent. (laughs) Yeah, no, I do it sometimes, but I think it's not, it's not good. Um, but (laughs) she is like the nicest lady. She exudes joy. And, um, she was, she has said that whenever they go on vacation, um, my brother and her, they like have all these well intentions to exercise. So they like pack all their clothes. Um, and then they never exercise. Um, they just take time (laughs) off. Um, but so I was like ready to go running and she like shows up and she has her running clothes and she's like, I'm going with you. And I was like, oh, and at first I kind of selfishly thought that, that like, oh, you're going to go with me. But, and she's like, I haven't run in a year and <laughs> like, how's this going to go? But we, we went for a run together and she, you know, like, I think that it was probably pretty hard for her. Um, but just seeing her like kind of like break the, ha- break, break the chain of never mm-hmm. exercising on a, on a, um, vacation. And she like did it with me. And then, um, we like did it together. And a couple of times she was like, how much further are we going? And I was like, it's okay. <laughs> we can do it. Like encouraging her. Um, lately, I think a lot of my runs, I used to have a pattern of being like these, my runs were very outcome focused, but now like doing something that was some mm. together, like us running mm-hmm. together and not being so like this run is for a purpose. This run is for a purpose. Yeah. But it was for each other, um, was really awesome. I loved running like with her so that we could do it together. Um, mm-hmm. at the end she was like, Oh my God. I can't believe I did that. No, that was really hard, but, um, I was like, you can do it. Like, we're going to, we're going to finish it together. And I really loved like running with her. Um, that's great. You know, instead of it being outcome focused. Yeah, yeah. that's nice. nice. I can, I can relate to that, that shift in, Hey, every workout has a purpose versus, you know, just doing it to, to connect yeah. with somebody or to share the yeah. experience or to just the for the joy, joy of the it. Process. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Awesome. I love it. Cody, well, thank, thank you, you Cody, so, much. so much. It was yeah, it's been great. Wonderful thank having you, you. Yeah. Thank you. It's been real fun. Good conversation. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I enjoyed it a lot. And, um, I love talking about sports psychology and like, I love, uh, just uh, like, I love talking about it from this perspective and like, uh, just a little bit more, uh, broad perspective of it. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. It's fun. And I think, I mean, even if our, I mean, everybody's a performer on some level, right? Mm -hmm. Like everybody has Mm -hmm. performance. And I think this conversation applies to just about anybody. So um, I hope it's useful. So listeners, let us know what you think. And Cody, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank y'all for listening.